Thank you. So, uh, yeah, most people here know, know my background. He more or less uh, shared the background. And I don't have that many employees. I only make soup for the Canadian employees, which is only a few hundred. Um, so what I'm going to share tonight is tech history. And I'm old, so I have seen history. Um, and I will tell you it's very cool. When I joined the board of BlackBerry, there was no BlackBerry. And then I saw it emerge, so everybody has a smartphone. And I'm going to tell you a couple, about a couple of things that I'm working on, which, are, w which will be history. And a decade from now, you're going to say, I can't believe nobody had one back then. So um, I built my company, a couple billion in sales. I sold it. I retired, moved to New York for five years, did a bunch of angel investing, sat on some boards. And one of the boards I sat on was Danby Appliances. They have the slogan, boring appliances since 1947. So I, the CEO resigned, and I said I could run that company. Um, so I went in to run it as an interim CEO. And uh, they, then they said they wanted me to sell the business. And I said, how much for? And they told me. So I said, fine, I'll take it. So that's how I ended up owning Danby Appliances. Uh, Danby Appliances, we do about $400 million in sales. We uh, make about uh, 2 million appliances. This is a picture from the drone. Uh, of the Guelph, which is our head office location. We have multiple factories, mostly in North America. So when I came into Danby, we make appliances, but I thought, um, is that what we make or do we make something else? And I thought about what are the problems we could solve. So I had to change the way we th thought and I thought, no, we don't make appliances, we make big boxes. And there's a problem, that is parcel theft, porch piracy. So is that something that we could solve? We decided to come up with a product, which we happen to call Parcel Guard, which sits on people's front porches. Now, actually, this is bigger if you're in the suburbs than if you're in Toronto, because many of you already have a parcel solution of some kind. But there's 70 million standalone households in North America. 70% of the people, I believe, will adopt some sort of parcel solution in the next decade. And I'm not arrogant enough to think it will be our solution, but we will be one of those solutions. It's reasonable to assume, based on us being in the market now, that we could have maybe a 20% market share. So that's 10 million pieces, which for us is enough that we can, it'll increase our sales probably by 50 to uh, even 100%. It could double us. And these products will get replaced about the same as freezers uh, once a decade. So there'll be an ongoing market. So that tells you how twisted I am and how eccentric I am in thinking differently about what we do. So that, I believe, is somewhat history. So what happens, you get, an, you get a, a delivery by, from UPS or Perlator, you get an email or text to say the parcel arrived at 1046 today, that it weighs three pounds. Uh, if the uh, driver happens to scan the barcode, it tells you what the barcode is. If it's too big to fit in the top, then you can um, uh, give the person a one-time use code, they can type in the code. You can look on the IP camera, see who delivered it. Um, you can remotely open it. If someone tries to tamper with it, it has a car alarm, so it screams at you. It's, it's a well-thought-out product, and I, we're approaching this as a family, just like we do with wine coolers or um, freezers. We will have a variety of big ones, small ones, fat ones, short ones, red ones, brick ones, aluminum, whatever. Um, so this product, actually, uh, we, we buy 11,000 tons of sheet metal a year, and so my original idea is we'll make it out of sheet metal, but this is actually made out of structural foam, plastic, because I wanted to, I went to the plastics factory to buy a little boot to go around the bottom because it can be an outdoor product, and then saw what they could do with that, so we ended up opening a factory in Coburg, and this product is made in Canada in Coburg. Um, we'll open a second factory, likely in New Jersey, to, uh, as the, the volume gets up, because we can only produce uh, the current molds and dyes about 250, 240 a day, actually. So it's the first smart mailbox. You saw it here first. Now, I also was bored, didn't have anything to do, so I thought I would start another business called Shipper B. So I'm now CEO of Shipper B and Danby Appliances, and we're going to disrupt the parcel industry. I, because I was doing parcel uh, guard, I thought about the parcel industry and saw that has a massive environmental footprint. Currently, if you ship a product from Guelph to Kitchener, it goes Guelph to Mississauga to Kitchener. You go from New York to New Jersey, it goes New York to Memphis to New Jersey, hub and spoke. We're going to reinvent the way 
parcels are moved. What we're doing is we're using these transfer mailboxes because the name of the company is Shipper B, we call these hives. So what would happen is a driver would pick up the products at the business, they go pick up five products, they drop them in the transfer mailbox or the hive, and then these hives are conveniently located at gas stations, which North America is mapped all along the interstates with gas stations. Then a driver would say, I'm going back to Guelph tonight. It would say, great, you're passing the Petro-Canada station, pick up six parcels, then when you go off in the exit at Highway 6, stop at the Shell station, drop off those six parcels. So those are commuter drivers. Those parcels travel with what we call the power of while, and there's almost no environmental footprint on that. So this actually takes trucks off the road. So it's a secure network of um, hives or transfer mailboxes. We've eliminated the hub of the hub and spoke. So we'll disrupt FedEx and UPS, just like Uber did to taxis and Airbnb did to hotels. And, and I know we're not supposed to be a, a plug, but we will be hiring 1,000 employees over the next 24 months. Um, and it's all by leveraging the power of while. That's the main environmental footprint savings we have. And we can save 73.1% of the greenhouse gas per parcel shift. This is my environmental legacy. In any ecosystem, there has to be money for all. So the gas stations get paid per parcel and they want the traffic. The drivers get paid for driving something they would do anyways. And it's a better gig if you want to do the endpoint driving than Uber. And uh, shippers save money. So in the future, whenever people move, parcels will go too. What questions can I answer? Four questions, let's do a standing ovation. Questions? How, how do you handle the issue where um, a person wants a pack package delivered from A to B within a certain time frame, but you don't have that while economy to be able to pick it up and drop it off? Do you have a separate fleet that you're doing to, to kind of sure up your system? That's an excellent question. So how do we meet service level agreements? We have three different service levels, four hour delivery, next day delivery, and three day delivery. Of course, it depends on how far you're going. You're not doing four hour from here to Vancouver. Uh, the way we do that is we have a network of super drivers and if you're the super driver in Kitchener, you're responsible for 14 hives and you get positively dispatched. One of the keys in business is 100% utilization. The super drivers are employees, they have benefits and they will be 100% utilized and the other occasional drivers might not be fully utilized. And they do the special things also. So they train the other drivers in their area. They clear the snow off the solar panels. You saw the snow solar panels. They sort parcels in the hives. They basically help keep the thing running. Excellent question. Oh, I guess, yes. Uh, yeah, you sound like you have a pretty busy day. So I'm curious to hear what your one time management tip would be. Uh, my one time management tip, you know, I wrote a book on time management uh, probably 20 years ago <laughs> called um, Time Leadership. And in that book, I wrote a section on the power of while. What can you do while you're doing something else? So I try to do things while I'm doing something else. The simplest example, I like to meet with everyone who works for me directly every week. I like to meet with everyone who works for them every two weeks. I meet with everyone who works down two levels uh, once a month, and I do walking meetings. Because I'm a health guy, how do I get my exercise? I go walking on a trail with my employees. That's, so use the power of while. I'm gonna be driving back to Guelph, what am I gonna be doing? Conference call, and then I've got my audiobooks. What are you doing right now while talking? <laughs> well, well I've, I just thought of another business. Do you want me to share it here? Yes. <laughs> you have five more minutes. <laughs> Do you uh, factor in or take in consideration with the competition, or do you fully focus on what you're doing and signal out everything? Um, you know, with respect to the industry, like for example, Penguin Pickup partnering with Walmart and having these urban centers for parcel pickups. Do you f take that into factor or no? So the question is, do I look at the competitors? Do I factor that into what I do? Of course, you always have to look at the competitive uh, landscape. If you spend too much time looking, you end up copying them, and then you're late. So I just told you my business idea. Go copy it. By the time you do it, 
you're going to be too late because we will have figured out some stuff that you have not yet figured out and we'll just be adding to and to it. Um, so I, I follow it, but I don't. The real competition is actually the big couriers. I mean, they're UPS, FedEx, Perlator, Canada Post. If we get 1% of the increase in parcel volume, 1% of the increase, not 1% of the parcel volume for, in, for four years, we're a billion dollar company. It's not that hard, it's easy. It's a good sized company. Last question. Uh, yeah, it is me. <laughs> um, what's, um, I really like the idea, by the way. Um, I'm just curious about the security. So, what do you do to ensure that a package is actually delivered? What happens if it's not? Okay, a excellent question and a question many people ask. We do the same background checks as UPS and FedEx. So you've got the same background check. The, ca the hives all have cameras. So we can see when someone picked it up. We have load sensors. We actually weigh the parcels. We know you picked up a bundle of 10 pounds. We know you dropped off a par bundle of 10 pounds. But the most important thing is we grade the drivers. So we ask the person who received the parcel, how do you grade the driver? So we will know whether or not you've done a thousand perfect deliveries and grading of drivers has proven to work. Plus, that question is the same question, most of you are too young to remember this, when Uber started, that everybody asked about Uber. When I'm a tech guy, when Uber first came out, I said, well, I'm not going to get in a car with a stranger. But now I don't think I would get in a car with a taxi driver pretty well because Uber is just, you know, it made it convenient. So anyway, with that, thank you very much. Thank you.